to Highland and a Heart, our TV series coverage continues. Uh, this year, we've been really getting into the series. We've been doing season by season plays um, and uh, intermittent interviews between them. We've, so far, we've been very blessed to have Adrian Paul and the wonderful Philip Aiken. Uh, now, as you can see this month, unfortunately, we don't have a Joe or an Amy, but we do have somebody very close to my heart who... Uh, has been there for us for in the beginning 25 years um so without further ado here is dr peter wingfield da, da, da. Da, da, da. and now live from hollywood <laughs> which i think true story true oddly story. enough it, it, it is it is yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll start contrast to the, the the first time we ever met uh, was 20... 25 years ago. Can you believe it? I know. And we don't look a day older, do we? No. You don't You don't look old enough. <laughs> Bless you. Um, yeah, I think it was a, I think it was a French bistro or something in London uh, where we... Um, something. No idea. I only know that because I reread the interview earlier. Um, I... <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah uh that was uh that was crazy that was so you were my first highlander interview um that i that i'd ever done uh but you were also my first uh actor that i interviewed and i would go on to to interview many more i think christopher lee and you know uh natalie portman and sort of all sorts of kind of you've done well for yourself mate good good job <laughs> right and then i realized it wasn't earning me any money and i had to quit but it was yeah. um <laughs> but that's you... that's yeah you're not the first artist to discover that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately uh but uh yeah no but you are my first um for which i'll always be eternally grateful because you are such a a lovely uh warm welcoming um uh person to and, and very grounded um person to meet you know they they always say you should never meet your heroes saying you're a hero but you know they always yeah, say that you know you shouldn't meet people that you admire or that you you know that things because you know they'll let you down but you know not a bit of it and um yeah no, that's fantastic so i appreciate that mate thank you thank you not at all but here we are 25. my mother would be very proud of me <laughs> <laughs> you did good mum. you did good um <laughs> so you know i'd love to talk as we don't have a huge amount of time, but I would love to talk a little bit about your life. Um, and we know, for those of us who do, that um, there has been a swing in your life to a degree where you studied medicine and then you became an actor. And then you left acting behind and you went into medicine. And that's in and, in and of itself is a fascinating story. But before we get to the medicine part, was there any part... About, was there anything about the arts and acting that interested you before you started down that road of uh, medical school and, and that kind of thing? I always, when I was a kid, I always thought of myself as a scientist. I, I mean, I thought of that as just that's that's kind of who I am. And uh, and, and uh, it, it was my dad was a, a doctor. He was uh, uh, he did. Obi Gyn, uh, he was a surgeon. <laughs> Although that's, it's, it's interesting now. Uh, now I'm a little in a different position. We we don't really think of Obi Gyn people as being surgeons. <laughs> I mean, yes, they cut people open, but they're not really surgeons. Anyway, that's a whole separate thing. Um, yeah, so it was sort of uh, it was kind of in the family. My brother, my elder brother, had gone to uh, to college to to do medicine and uh actually i mean he originally went to do physics but then switched into medicine uh, and and is a gp um so so that was kind of always it was always there in uh, as as kind of the baseline of the the lens through which i saw the world um but i started acting in school did a couple of plays and and there was something about that experience that was very uh just felt felt like a good fit it resonated with me um and i did national youth theater in wales which was a four-week 
uh, residential course uh, every summer where, I mean, you know, I was, I think I was 18, 17 or 18 the first time I did that. And, and you were away living on your own for four weeks. I mean, it was flipping fantastic. <laughs> it was like, it was like being a, a, a student, a college student. You had your own room and, and I mean, you had, it was, it was very regimented in the sense that every morning we would, we would start the day with uh, an hour of uh, a physical warm up and then an hour of uh, vocal warm ups. And then, then we would do improv stuff and, and then rehearse. And I mean, it was very structured in that way. But it was also tremendously there's tremendous amount of freedom, and uh, and and I'm, uh, the thing that that I think really kind of changed everything for me was I was used to being uh, being smart, being good at stuff, and and teachers liking me because I was I, I, I was good at their their subject and. And the, the people around me, I, I could kind of, I could be impressive uh, in, in that context. And I, in National Youth Theatre, I felt like I knew nothing mm -hmm. and that I was surrounded by people that were just sharper than I was and, and, and wittier and, and just, just were more interesting in such a fundamental way that I hadn't experienced before. And, and I, f I felt challenged by it in a way that, that I, didn't, I didn't feel the same kind of challenge in, in kind of academic exam taking stuff. Uh, I, I sort of, I knew how to, I knew how to get better at exam stuff. You just, you sat down with the books, you learned the stuff in the books and then you were better at it. And, and acting, I, I had no idea. I just had this sense that some people were really good at it mm. and I wanted to be really good at it and I had no idea how. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, I mean, that, that really, it changed my understanding of, of what intelligence was because it made me feel like there was, there was another way of looking at the world, which I just hadn't, I hadn't been challenged with. I hadn't been, you know, the people that were teaching me things in my family and my school and, and that they weren't teaching me this same way of just looking at the world totally differently and seeing how it, how would things shake out if, if you looked from a different perspective. Um, so that, that kind of, that, that hit very deep and, and I wanted I wanted to explore that. I wanted to live in that world, uh, and and I had I, I mean, there was nobody in my family that that came from that came from the arts. I mean, my grandfather played music in an orchestra uh, way way back in the. I mean, he was. This would have been between the wars, probably. Um, when I mean, he just you know, he was he would do whatever he needed to make a living. And uh, so, but, but then nobody, nobody had been, you know, there, there were no artists in that sense. So everyone at school and everybody in my influential circle said, you, you got to get a job. You got to, you know, you got to go to medical school and get, become a doctor. And then if you want to still do this, acting stuff, you can do that on the side, but, uh, but, you know, you need to, you need to have something to fall back on. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's, that's, that was my thinking. That's, uh, that's what I did. I went to medical school. And when I got there, there were some things that I really liked and some things that I really didn't like. And, and there was a very regimented sense of what a doctor was. Right. Uh, and I think that was, that was, in the system, but it was also in me. What I expected a doctor to be was very, uh, was very much the kind of nineteen uh, fifties view of uh, a wise old man in a white coat, and uh, you know that that's and and that was not who I was. I, it wasn't anyone that I I, I aspired to be. It was it, I just I couldn't see how to be 
the kind of doctor that that I felt I was going to become. Um, so I, you know, I sort of bumbled my way through medical school. But as it came towards the end, uh, I, I just it was like, no, this is not me. This is I. I can't live. I can't live forty years of pretending to be this person when it's mm-hmm. when it's not who I am. So I. So I quit and uh, and went to drama school. And and had a fantastic career pretending to be other people. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which is interesting. We, yeah, and, and I, I mean, the, the there was when I when I applied to medical school the second time round when I was, God, I don't know, 47 or 48 or something, and had been, had been working, earning my living for 20 odd years. Uh, um, the, the thing that I, uh, there's this very weird thing that um, going back into medicine, people would ask me you know, so uh what have you learned as an actor that uh, that you can bring with you into medicine and i i, I would say what i learned the, the most important thing i learned as an actor is you you can't fake it mm. which is a really contrary sounding idea but the best actors the actors that are that I recognize as being the kind of actor that I am impressed by, that I wanted to be. They don't fake anything. Mm. They convince themselves of the reality of the situation, and then they just live in it. Yeah. And, and I, I see that in, in my work, looking at it, uh, you know, with the lens of history as well. The stuff that I, that I like, that I'm proud of, is when I wasn't faking it yeah 20 20 odd years of pretending to be other people and what you learn is yeah you don't pretend anything no that's true that's true where is it it is interesting um i've done a little bit myself and one of the first the the most revelatory pronounce that wrong thing that i found out that acting isn't acting and that's that's Mm. the you know the the crazy truth of it um is, is is actually believing those moments that you live in and which is not to say that there aren't lots of Lots of people who uh, earn their living pretending to be somebody that, yeah, I mean, you, 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 you know, you have to watch them for five seconds to realize that they're, they're just faking all of it. Yeah, yeah that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's great. Um, so I remember uh, the first time we met, you <laughs> told me of one of your early, early roles in an advert. Uh, and at the time, I can still remember being blown away because I hadn't realized it was you. And I remember how much I loved that. I think it was a Sega advert uh, where you oh, were yeah. in a uh, sort of a little kind of uh, in a, a, a bus or a, like a motorhome or something. And with all this kind of like in a chair whizzing around and playing like Sonic the Hedgehog, stuff like that. Yeah, um, Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> He's still going. I know. Look at him now. He's done really well for himself. Doesn't look a day older than back in the 90s. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, bugger. Um, so, uh, yeah. So how did uh, how did that evolve for you then? So we've we've moved from uh, you decided uh, that, you know, medicine's not for you right now. You've taken a sidestep and, and gone into acting. Um, were there any points at which you were worried that made, maybe you'd made the wrong decision? Uh, that uh, Did you feel like or did... I can't imagine it all felt like it all clicked into place really easily because life's not like that. But yeah, what was that sort of journey like for you? So uh, drama school was uh, was kind of, was great. It was you know I was doing what I wanted to do. I was managing to keep my nose above water financially. I was doing kids parties at weekends to uh, to earn earn money. I had some some grants some scholarships uh, so i you know that that was okay and then i mean the point of drama school i think in my experience was to to get a good agent mm-hmm. you know because you showcase at the end of uh, 
at the end of your training. And uh, with a good agent, you get to go to auditions. And and I, I had work uh, before I, I finished drama school. So I went straight from drama school into a series, yeah. ironically, medics, playing a medical student. Um, before that show ended, I had my next job, which was a series called Soldier Soldier. Mm. Um, uh, and a across the two of those, there was a another job, a, a, a mini series for the Beeb uh, called God. I can't even remember now. Uh, you know, so so it was all very smooth. Yeah. It was just like clockwork. Fantastic. And then when Soldier Soldier ended, I had no work. And I, I remember that uh, happening and, and there just being this blackness, this void uh, and, and the feeling of, okay, that might be it. I might never work again. And I'm going for auditions and I'm not getting them. And, and you have no idea when the, when the darkness will, will pass. Yeah, and, and that's I mean that that's just how that's the job that's how the career works uh and the longer you're in it the more you you kind of find some degree of comfort in that and the darkness is not quite as scary each time it happens but it's always it's always the same where you you know there are periods where you have no job lined up and you you know, I always just say, you know, I, I I might be retired. I just don't know yet. I, I'll I'll know that I'm retired in fifty years when I look back and go, yeah, no, that was the last time I worked. So uh, so I guess that was it. <laughs> um, you, you you just you live in that space yeah. where it's always it doesn't matter how how good a year is, mm -hmm. it doesn't guarantee that next year is going to be anything at all. Um. I mean, you know, there, there is a level, of, there's a level at which you, you kind of break through a ceiling. And I, I don't think Tom Hanks worries about whether he's ever going to work again. No, I don't think. Um, but I do know Dustin Hoffman worries about it all the time. I mean, really? he's just, he's a very anxious guy and, and, and he's constantly worried about, is, is that it? I, you know, I, I, maybe this is the last movie I'll ever make. Mm. Um, so, so I mean that that just that is how it is. I, I never I never felt I never thought I've made a mistake. I've never I never thought this this is the wrong this was the wrong thing for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I I mean I I sure as hell worried about whether I could put a roof over my head and feed myself. Yeah, yeah. worried about that all the time. Yeah, and and then that you know that that changes again when when you become a parent mm. where i mean everything changes when you become a parent um and 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 the other thing that that i think changes is whatever you do if you do the same thing for 20 years it gets kind of boring mm. um and and so it, it was really like 07, 08 uh, for, for the, the youngsters out there who don't remember such things. 07, 08 was a pretty catastrophic uh, collapse of the world economy um, where just everything felt like it was falling to pieces. Um, the financial markets crashed and we, we realized that uh, th there was uh, a whole load of just bad behavior going on uh, in order to, to generate wealth amongst a very small group of people and that the rest of us were picking up the tab for it. Uh, and, you know, the, the, so, so there was... You know, in the midst of that catastrophe, uh, I I certainly did a lot of uh, kind of self reflection and and thinking about about what I wanted to be doing. And you know, being a parent is a big part of that, where you you think about 
what you can say whatever you like but your kids understand who you are and what is important to you by your behavior mm -hmm. and and i you know you start you sort of vaguely think about your uh what's what's it going to be in your obituary you know that uh, that this this person made a whole bundle of tv shows that uh you know they were fine mm -hmm. but is that is that what i wanted to is that what i wanted to to be to give to to my my legacy for whatever that uh that weight that might hold you know that and 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 there was this other I, i'd done a lot of uh, charity work for I heard my American accent on charity, charity work uh, for UNICEF. Mm. And there, there was a, uh, there'd been this uh, vaccination program that they'd been running where they were using local communities, women in local communities to, to, uh, they would train them so that they could give the vaccinations because they knew they, they, they just couldn't they couldn't they didn't have enough people that they could vaccinate mm -hmm. uh vast numbers of of kids in remote communities so they would train local people and let them they just give them the supplies and let them go do it yeah. and and i i'm i'm listening to somebody do a presentation about this this story and i'm feeling i'm feeling jealousy for these 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 women in remote villages because they were doing something that felt meaningful to me and and that uh, i think i mean i always think it's important that you you recognize things that that affect you that touch you that there's there's something in that and and the more i looked at it the more i kind of examined it the more i thought it's because there is still that that connection to medicine, that connection to to being part of of healthcare and of healing that uh, that is unfulfilled. But I kind of I, I locked it away in a closet and I I bolted the door. But it's it's starting to rattle. I can hear it rattling in there, and the door is starting to shake. Yeah. Um. So. A combination of things. I I, uh, I started doing uh, academic courses, science courses at the weekends to to see what that felt like to be back in academics, and uh, and did you know I started off doing physics, mm -hmm. basic physics. Flipping loved it. it was great. Uh, was was. As I say, it was exactly as uh, as I'd left it. It was indeed exactly as Isaac Newton had left it. I mean, nothing had <laughs> really changed. <laughs> and then I did uh, did biology, a mm. uh, basic biology course, and it was completely different than last time I did it. I mean, just so much understanding of how how things work inside of the cell that that was that i just i'd never come across before because 25 years before that had been the stuff of the frontier of science that that i i didn't have any access to any exposure to um so anyway i, I did all the the basic courses that i i needed to do to put in a medical school application and uh and applied to med school yeah fantastic we have to talk about it obviously one of the shows that you did in amongst that time <laughs> um which you are very well known for uh was uh whole beat no i'm kidding highlander um <laughs> <laughs> no we like holby too um yeah but holby uh, was life-changing experience for me so what can you tell me about this patient and make it snappy i've got a hell of a rhyme to get through um <sighs> Okay, turn around a sec. But you're not blonde. Surprise. Obviously, you know, we need to talk about Highlander a little bit. I don't know at, at what point in your career that kind of popped up. 
Um, but do you recall how it came to you? And at the time when it did, did you know anything about it at all? Uh, I think it was, you know, we were a couple of seasons in, but obviously there was the movies before and, and all that kind of thing. Yeah, I knew nothing about the, I knew nothing about the TV series. Um, I I knew the movie. I, I think I'd seen the movie. I don't think I watched it just for the, the audition. I think I'd, I think I'd seen it, um, but but I, I I was living in London. I was working as a, a jobbing actor, as as we say, you know, going from one job to the next. Um, I'd done some stuff that was that was kind of well known, but nothing that was going to change my life. Uh, this show was filming in Paris. They were they were looking for someone to play, you know, a couple of days work in Paris and then uh, come back for the finale of that season. So it'd be another couple of episodes later on in the year. Um, I had uh, probably like four A4 sides, a couple of scenes, mm -hmm. uh, nothing else, no other information really about uh, about the show. And I, I had to try and make sense of it. And, I mean, it didn't make any sense, you know. <clears throat> these uh, these crazy people that wander around with swords, trying to chop each other's heads off, and I mean, it didn't make any sense at all. Um, but you know, trip to Paris and be put up in a nice hotel and do some filming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, sure. I was I was on for that. Um, the the back in those days it was not particularly common to do auditions on tape mm -hmm. but it for for a series like this that was shooting somewhere else the I, I just recorded something on tape and uh, in the the casting director's office uh heard fairly soon after that they they wanted me to do it flew out there and did the first episode mm -hmm. and uh you know it clearly went well i mean there was something about the character that i understood that i that I, or what they what they wanted from the character that i i totally understood from just the the stage direction before the first scene mm -hmm. which was you know he's the, the oldest man in the world he's at least five thousand years old but but you know could be much older he just doesn't really remember it gets vague after five thousand years um uh, and and then when when we find him when we first see him <clears throat> there's been all this build up and McLeod walks into this room and there's this kid who's just sitting down eating pizza mm -hmm. that I understood okay I, I get what you're playing here you're playing where we're building the expectation that it's Gandalf that it's this wizened old bearded guy and and then when we get there no it's not it's it's somebody who's very young and that, that makes sense in context because 5,000 years ago people didn't live to be 70 they just so if you died the first time 5,000 years ago you would be young mm -hmm. and you would stay that age yeah. and and also if if the show is set up that you know everyone is trying to kill each other all the time the way you survive 5,000 years is by not fighting at all because mm -hmm. because you're gonna at some point you're gonna get unlucky or or just come across someone who's bigger and tougher than you and you'll die so so this guy if he's five thousand years old he probably has avoided fighting as much as possible and the way to do that is just to blend in and not look like what anyone expects so i, I understood all of that just from the stage direction. And yeah. then after that, it's okay, well, uh, I'm just gonna play everything throwaway and casual and we'll see what that looks like. Mikasa resu casa. Mikasa? So knowing nothing about the show was, was really helpful because yes. there were no stakes for me. No. It allowed me to play it very, very lightly. Yeah. Which is fantastic. Yeah, and then that that works. 
yeah. and that works for the the writers they they can then they can see that i understand that idea so they can throw different ideas and then i can play variations on that and throw different things back to them and it becomes a, a conversation yeah. um which which i mean that worked that worked very well for uh, what's that i joined in i joined in season three i think yeah, yeah season and three. then we went to season six so yeah three four seasons yeah yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, what is fantastic about Mythos as a character is what he went through as a character within those. We, you know, we we suddenly found out he was, you know, used to be a villain, used to be a bad guy in Comes of Horsemen and Revelations, which are still my two favorite episodes. Um, and as you say, they they decided to throw that at you. And, you know, and that that worked so well for the character to see that switch from being you know this kind of like chilled kind of guy just whatever to then suddenly just turning on the you know the that was that was a great great piece of writing it was a tremendously strong idea yeah yeah that was it was perfect and i think a lot of people to this day wish there had been a showdown with you and duncan and then i guess talking about mythos in general there was, you know, it, it didn't end at the end of season six. You know, there was Highlander Endgame, um, which uh, which was, I still like it, um, you know, and it was uh, a film. It was a <laughs> it was a film. I managed to liberate that from their lost phone. There's blood on it. I didn't say it was easy. It it, it had its problems, uh, but like most mm -hmm. films do um and uh you know it was uh as you, as you may recall I, I was there for a couple of days and and i think it was the same few days that that uh, or at least some of the days that you were there doing your stuff too um and i'll forever be grateful for the fact that you got out of the car and spotted me and said hello because i knew nobody on that set <laughs> <laughs> and i said it was miles away the first time i'd ever been to romania and uh it was you know, quite daunting but that was lovely um how do you feel thinking about if you allow yourself to kind of invest in the character that much how do you feel it ended for mythos um in the sense of a sense of were you happy with how it was left do you kind of wish it made it you know because at the end of the source or during the source or how it's very ambiguous um it's a runoff into the woods never to be seen again um did you ever have a the kind of the, the idea of how you would like to see that character sort of end i i honestly didn't um my my feeling uh at the end of the source was that he wasn't dead i mean, uh I, I think just from a practical business point of view uh there was there was good reason to have a dramatic end but there was also really good reason to not commit themselves to anything yeah um so it always felt like you know they could they could bring that character back but yeah. uh, i don't think he's dead yeah. um i i i was never really one for uh for kind of writing my own storylines about what was uh, uh where the character should go um it's just not not really something that that I've ever done. Um, I I was very much uh, it when when a story was presented, I was very much engaged in. Okay, if this is the story that you want to explore, then I have these ideas about it. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't. Uh, I I never spent time thinking about you know what stories we should tell about this character. Yeah, sure. uh, that that didn't feel like uh, that was my that's my strength particularly. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fair enough. So, where are we now? Right now, you're uh, you're working in hospital. Uh, yeah, in, yeah, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, it is <laughs> actually. It's it's good. Medical stuff aside, are we still acting? Um, interested to know. 
So uh, the last the last thing I did was uh, was a podcast. I mean, essentially a radio play um, mm. uh, called uh, oh, it was called the Flood. What's it? Some Gospels. That's right. what it was called. Gospels of the Flood. Mm -hmm. um, which you know that kind of thing is is plausible for me because it just means somebody books a studio. I go, I record, I walk away. Yeah. That, you know, I can I can manage my schedule so that's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of filming, uh, really not on the horizon because I would have to make myself available yeah. for work and then audition for things and then the thing would be in the future. So I, I would have to write off easily six months if I was, if I wanted to do that, yeah. Um, I mean, even the, the last thing that I filmed uh, was was between medical school and starting anesthesiology residency. Um, I had a four week break, mm -hmm. and uh, a buddy of mine, Stuart Geller, was was doing an episode of Beauty and the Beast up in Toronto, and it, the timing just happened to work he contacted me and said would i be interested so went up and, uh, and hung out with him which is fantastic it's great uh that i mean even something like that would be very difficult now with enough lead time i could probably manage to get a week off but but it would it would be hard yeah. um and and you know, people ask me all the time do, do you do you do you still do acting do you miss acting and i, I honestly i don't think about it mm -hmm. so so i guess that tells you that no i don't i'm very i'm very engaged in what i'm doing it's it is full on my brain is in it all the time and and that's that's okay for me at the moment. That's uh, you know, it, down the line when I've been doing it 10, 15 years, will I be bored with it? Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. um, would I then start thinking about trying to do something in the arts again? Yeah, maybe. I I don't know. I really I have no uh, I have no crystal ball. Right at this moment, no, I'm I'm not doing anything, and I wouldn't expect to be able to do anything in the uh, in the immediate future. Yeah, thank you. well, thank you, thank you so much, so much, Peter, for doing this. I really appreciate it, and it's been wonderful as always to talk to you. Um, it's been a fantastic 25 years um, uh, that uh, over the time that we sort of have bumped into each other over now uh, now and then, and um, yeah, not long may it continue um so thank you thank you so much i really appreciate it absolute and pleasure my friend absolute pleasure with that i will let you lead us out this is peter wingfield on highlander heart reminding you to hold fast and don't lose your head Perfect. You are the only person <laughs> who's got that perfect. <laughs> Somebody always leaves something out. <laughs>